Oh, this is going to be good. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, family. Welcome to the Mental House Sports Edition. Um, this gives me pleasure to do this article, and it's written, um, an article written by Kyle Corbin, and y'all know him. I think he's back with the Utah Jazz now. He wrote this on April 8th, and um, I really appreciate the spirit and the manner that Mr. Kyle Corver took in uh, doing this letter. So I want to share it with my audience, and I hope y'all uh, make a comment below, okay, and that you enjoy it just as much as I enjoy bringing it to you. When the police break your teammate's leg, you think it will wake you up a little. When they arrest him on a New York street, throw him in jail for the night, and leave him with a season-ending injury, you think it would sink in. You think that you'd know there was more to the story. You think. Nope. I still remember my first reaction when I first heard what happened to Thabo. Uh, it was 2015, late in the season. Thabo and I were teammates on the Hawks, and we'd flown in to New York after, late after a game in Atlanta. When I awoke the next morning, our team group tech was going nuts. Details were hazy, but the guys were saying, Tapo hurt his leg during an arrest. Wait, he spent the night in jail? Huh? Everyone was pretty upset and confused. Well, almost everyone. My response was different. I'm embarrassed to admit it. Which is why I want to share the story today. Before I tell the rest of the story, let me just say real quick, Thabo wasn't some random teammate of mine or some guy in the league who I had knew just a little bit. We become legitimate friends that year in our downtime. He was my go-to teammate to talk to about stuff beyond the basketball world, politics, religion, culture, you name it. Thabo brought a perspective that wasn't particularly of an NBA player. It's, um, and it's easy to see why. Before we were teammates in Atlanta, the guy had played professional ball in France, Turkey, and Italy. He spoke three languages. Davo's mother was from Switzerland, and his father was from South Africa. They lived together in South Africa before Tabo was born, then left because of apartheid. It didn't take long for me to figure out that Tabo was one of the most interesting people that I had ever been around. We respected each other. We were cool, you know? We had each other's back. Anyway, on the morning I found out that Tabo had been arrested, want to know what my first thought was about my friend and my teammate? My first thought was, what was Tabo doing out in a club on a back-to-back. -back. Yeah. Not how's he doing. Not what happened during the arrest. Not something seems off with this story. Nothing like that. Before I knew the full story and before I even had a chance to talk with Davo, I sort of blamed him. I thought, well, if I'd been in Davo's shoes out at a club late at night, the police wouldn't have arrested me. Not unless I was doing something wrong. Cringe. It's not like it was a conscious thought. It was pure reflex. The first thing to pop into my head. I was worried about him, no doubt. But still, cringe. A few months later, a jury found Tabo not guilty on all charges. He settled with the city of, over New York NYPD's use of force against him. And then the story just sort of disappeared. Well, away from the news. But Tabo's surgery had went and but Tabo's surgery and went through rehab. He had surgery and then he went through rehab. Pretty soon another NBA season began and we were back on the court again. Life went on. But I couldn't shake my discomfort. I mean, I hadn't been involved in the accident. I hadn't even been there. So why did I feel like I let my friend down? Why did I feel like I let myself down? 
a few weeks ago, something happened at a Jazz home game that brought back many of those old questions. Maybe you saw it. We were playing against the Thunder, and Russell Westbrook made a fan in the crowd, and Russell Westbrook and a fan in the crowd exchanged words during the game. I didn't actually see or hear what happened. And if you were following it on TV or Twitter, maybe you had a similar initial viewing of it. Then after the game, one of our reporters asked me for my response to what had gone down between Russell and the fan. I told him I hadn't seen it and added something like, but you know Russ, he gets in, into it with the crowd a lot. Of course, the full story came out that night. What actually happened was that a fan had said some really ugly things as close range, at a close range to Russ. Russ had then responded. After the game, he said his he felt the comments were racially charged. The incident struck a nerve with our team. Everyone was upset. Hmm. In a closed-door meeting with the president of the Jazz, the next day, my teammates shared stories of similar experiences they had, of feelings degraded in a way that went beyond acceptable heckling. One teammate talked about how his mom had called him right after the game, concerned for his safety in SLC. One teammate said the night felt like being in a zoo. One of the guys in the meeting was Thabo. He's my teammate in Utah now. I look over at him, and I remember that night and his night in New York City. Everyone was upset. I was upset and embarrassed, too. But there was another emotion in the room that day, one that was hard to put a finger on. It was almost like disappointment mixed with exhaustion. Guys were just sick and tired of it all. This wasn't the first time they'd taken part in a conversation about race in their NBA careers. And it wasn't the first time they had the chance to address the hateful actions of others. And one thing, one big thing that got brought up a lot in the meeting was how incidents like this, they weren't only about people directly involved. This wasn't only about Russell and some heckler. It was more than that. It was about what it means just to exist right now as a person of color in a mostly white space. It was about racism in America. Before the meeting ended, I joined the team's demand for a swift response and a promise from the jazz organization that would address the concerns that we all had. I think my teammates and I all felt it was a first step or a big step in the right direction. But I don't think anyone, anyone, feels satisfied. There's an elephant in the room that I've been thinking about over the last few weeks. It's the fact that demographically, we've been, we're, if we're being honest, I have more in common with the fans in the crowd of, at your average NBA game than I have with the players on the court. And after the events in Salt Lake City last month, as long as I've been discussing them since, I really started to recognize the role those demographics play in my privilege. It's like, I may be Tabo's friend or Ekapi's teammate or Russ's colleague. I may work with those guys. And I absolutely, 100% stand with them. But I look like the other guy. And whether I like it or not, I'm beginning to understand how that means something. What I'm realizing is no matter how passionately I commit to being an ally and no matter how unwavering my support is for NBA and WNBA players of color, I'm still in this conversation from a privileged perspective and opting into it, which of course means that on the flip side, I could just as easily opt out of it. Every day, I'm given that choice. I'm granted that privilege. 
based on the color of my skin. In other words, I can say every right thing in the world. I can voice my solidarity with Russ after what happened in Utah. I can evolve my position on what happened to Thabo in New York. I can be that weird dude in Get Out bragging about how he had voted for Obama a third term. I can contend, condemn every racist heckler I've ever known. But I can also fade into the crowd and my face can blend in with the other faces of those hecklers anytime I want. I realize now that maybe and I realize that now. And maybe in years past, just realizing something would have felt like progress. But it's not years past. It's today. And I now have to do better. So I'm trying to push myself further. I'm trying to ask myself, what should I actually do? How can I, as a white man, part of this systematic problem, become part of the solution when it comes to racism in my workplace, in my community? And then this very country that I love. These are the questions that I've been asking myself lately. And I don't think I have all the answers yet. But here are the ones that are starting to ring the most true. I have to continue to educate myself on the history of racism in America. I have to listen, and I'll say it again because that's very important. I have to listen. I have to support leaders who see racial justice as fundamental, as something that's at the heart of nearly every major issue in our country today. And I have to support the policies that do the same. I have to do my best to recognize when to get out of the way in order to amplify the voices of marginalized groups so that so often get lost. But maybe more than anything, I know that as a white man, I have to hold my fellow white men accountable. We all have to hold each other accountable. And we all have to be accountable, period. Not just for our own actions, but also for the ways that our inactions can create a safe space for toxic behavior. And I think the standard that we have to hold ourselves to is, in this crucial moment, is higher than it's ever been. We have to be active. We have to actively be supporting the causes of those who've been marginalized precisely because they've been marginalized. Two concepts that I've been thinking about a lot lately are guilt and responsibility. When it comes to racism in America, I think that guilt and responsibility tend to be seen as much more or less the same thing. But I'm beginning to understand how there's a real difference. 